I'm absolutely delighted now to be joined by Etienne Stott, who is firstly an Olympic gold medalist, uh, but secondly, and most importantly for our conversation today, is a Extinction Rebellion activist. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, Extinction Rebellion or XR's uh, plan for mass mobilisation later this year in April. Uh, but before we get into any of that, uh, firstly, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today, Etienne. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you very much. It's uh, nice to be here. And I don't know how who's watching, um, but I hope you're having a good time. And I hope I'll be able to say some interesting things. I'm sure you will. Um, so to kick us off there, nice and straightforward, why is XR organising this mobilisation in London in April? Well, I think the main reason is that we are in time of crisis. We are in a time of uh, climate and ecological um, emergency, um, but also now I think they are the issues are being revealed as being connected. You know, we're seeing the cost of living crisis being uh, blown apart. You know, exposing why, how come we are so uh, vulnerable to this? Why has the government been so done such a bad job of of allowing this to happen? We're seeing the discontent in various different places in society, and I think the main reason is that people are feeling that their government is not listening to them. They're not listening to the voices of ordinary people. And um, Extinction Rebellion is asking um, for an end to the fossil fuel era, but not to be, you know, these decisions to be made by ordinary people, not put in the hands of the, 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 the government and the politicians who so far are either very, very much asleep at the wheel and incompetent who are or who are corrupt or perhaps a bit of both. Because um, right now it seems, you know, so many people are realising the connection to these issues more and more, you know, so many people realising the danger, the peril that we're in. And we're trying to, you know, propose a pathway um, to make some change happen. And uh, it seems like there is a lot of yeah, a lot of people are realizing. Yeah, this is this is something they don't want to just stand by and watch on the TV. And so you said there that you're trying to propose a pathway. What is the kind of concrete demands that XR have got that they're trying to put to the fore in this mobilization? So the demand is for an end to the fossil fuel era, but I think that's the kind of the what. But what we really want, really, is for citizens' assemblies um, on climate and ecological justice to be to be instigated by the government and for the government to listen to those to those voices and to, for them to be run in a proper way so that they have that legitimacy that you know citizens assemblies the voice of ordinary people are heard and the decisions that can come out of that will be almost it's almost inconceivable that they would be worse than the decisions that are, are being made now i think the citizens assemblies are a very very powerful way of actually bringing the voices of ordinary people in to make this plan that we so desperately need things are really bad the lives of so many uh, people in this country and, and certainly around the world are being made worse by uh, the incompetence and the lack of lack of a lack of a sensible plan and it's completely it's completely scandalous our future is being ripped away from us there's people who right now who are never you know, not even going to get the chance to vote on any of these things whose futures are being literally destroyed by the decisions that are being made now. And that's completely wrong. And we don't think that our political system can deliver those the changes that are required. You know, our, our, our political system is oppositional by its very nature. We need to be working together right now. It's unrepresentative because the people that need to make, you know, the people who are most affected by these decisions aren't in the room when these decisions are made. And the fact is, you know, our our government has how our, our political system has been captured by the interests of really powerful um powerful interest in the fossil fuel industry animal agriculture industry and you know many others besides you know that are actually stopping us making the progress that we need and if we were to have a citizens assembly these matters would be brought into focus by you know not by with slogans not with kind of short-term thinking people would be making decisions based on the you know really solid information and making it that in a just and fair way because it would be a about how it affects them people would be thinking about how it affects everybody rather than at the moment decisions seem to be made 
for about how it's going to affect a few people who are close to those decision makers and that's not going to work we are approaching you know the time in in human civilization where that we we can't we can't afford that something has to change so for our viewers some of them might not be familiar with the concept of a citizen assembly could you just talk us through yes what I that can, looks yeah. like in practice yeah thank you yeah sorry uh, it's hard to know exactly um you know uh, citizens assemblies are sometimes quite some known about in some places and sometimes not so citizens assembly is a, a collection of uh, ordinary people but they're chosen through a process called sortition so it's basically like a jury where you're randomly selected and it'd be across you know ra random selection from across the uk but then there's a process called sortition which basically um sorts sorts out that random selection of people into a representative sample of the kind of demographics in all different ways and all different um kind of methods all different measures i suppose and what you end up with is basically something like 100 people it could be bigger it could be a bit smaller it, you know the exact nuts and bolts of it i don't know exactly how many but you end up with a, a representative sample of of people of this country and of course in that room you would have people um you know with uh, from all sorts of uh, demographic social backgrounds educational backgrounds uh, cultural beliefs you'd even have people in there who are potentially you know climate skeptics maybe even denialists um but almost certainly you wouldn't have many millionaires and billionaires in that room because they they are they are not they're not representative of so the ordinary people in this room um much more ordinary than the people who govern us these days it would seem um and they would get to hear those real the facts from the scientists from the social scientists from the from the engineers you know the people who know the solutions the solutions out there exist it's a matter of weaving them in so that no one gets thrown under the bus no you know in industries that are you know particularly carbon intensive for example this isn't about just shutting them down it would be like right it's sensible that we need to downscale these these businesses these industries but what we're going to do those people need to be retrained and we need to work out ways of doing things that are fair and do not you know respect people's lives respect people um for you know their their qualities not just for their particular job that they're doing at the time so i think citizens assemblies are very very powerful and they're used in different places all around the world they've been you can in, on extinction rebellion's website there's quite a lot of good examples actually of where they're used to kind of tackle kind of thorny complicated problems that can't just be reduced to you know something written on the side of a bus or a 30 second you know radio or tv interview they are a way of it's sometimes called deliberative democracy it's where people talk and work things out together rather than just fighting and shouting at each other brilliant that's a really helpful explanation so just jumping back now to um the april mobilization uh, what what's going to be happening in london in april so we are hoping for a hundred well our target that we've said you know we want a hundred thousand people but this is just a kind of number that sounds interesting and draws people in but we want a lot of people we are focusing this time around in contrast to some other of the other um, large scale uprisings that we've had on uh, making it really um really easy for people to get involved so instead of uh, the overnight occupations which are probably like the main bone of contention with the police or the authorities as it were we're just going to come back day after day we're going to pack up in the evening so it's kind of some way slightly different from the from the from the way we do things because i think extinction rebellions always said you know we don't think marches and rallies are particularly effective at making change you know the stop the war in iraq march it was you know a huge number of people but they went home after one day the politicians weathered the weathered the the chat for a little while and then you know they cracked on and, and with terrible terrible consequences but we're saying here we're going to come back the next day and come back the next day and come back the next day to make sure that our voices are unignorable and so the priority has switched you know there's this kind of phrase attendance over arrest it's going to be a really safe space for everybody to come along um there's lots of work being done in the background with the organizations to make it so that it's um, going to be well extinction rebellion actions or i in my in my experience i've been to loads are always very controlled and calm and um, people understand what's going on and there's a you know people it's generally very uh 
easy to kind of figure out what's going on if you're even if you're new to it but this will be much more um easy for people just to come and get involved who've never we're hoping people who basically you know about this issue who care about this issue but have not felt able to protest they'll feel able to come along and say yeah I'm, I'm gonna have my voice heard because we need now you know we're saying um we need all those people I think it's something like eight out of ten people in the UK now are seriously concerned about the climate emergency we need a, a, only a tiny fraction of those people to come out come down to London and say actually this is enough I'm not standing for this nonsense anymore because it is nonsense it's completely outrageous and we just need people to come down come for the day on Friday Saturday Sunday and Monday and um, each day there's going to be different activities I think they're working out the the different um the different things but broadly speaking you know it's a simple thing bring your buddies bring bring a bring a, some water and uh, bring a friend join up with your either your local group or come with you know some of the organizations that we're hoping are going to be there and just be there stand there be counted and make sure that we are heard and that is to me it's pretty simple um it's yeah it may take a few days out of your you know your precious time which i know we all know is precious but we think we can do something very interesting if we get you know a large number of people who are not going to be ignored that would be cool i think so one of the things I wanted to put to you is you look at the history of Extinction Rebellion, the, the relatively short history of Extinction mm. Rebellion, it must be said. Um, in 2019, uh, when XR sort of really first sort of burst onto the scene, I think most people would agree that it had a pretty profound impact on public mm. consciousness around climate and political consciousness around the climate, probably jointly with the school strike movement, which was really yeah, taken indeed, up at yeah, that absolutely. time. I guess since since 2019, um, you know, what we've seen is that the government is still very much accelerating with the licensing of new oil and gas fields. Um, you know, we're seeing very much business as usual when it comes to energy, when it comes to transport, when it comes to all the issues, agriculture, all the issues that are uh, mm -hmm. driving the climate crisis <clears throat> um, at the moment. And we've seen Extinction Rebellion and other groups uh, like Just Up Oil or Inside Britain uh, over those last four years engage continually in these in, I guess, series of kind of big mobilizations or of like small scale disruptive actions. And yet that energy that was around XR in 2019 and the the shaping of political and social conversations around climate that it drove has kind of dissipated. And we've seen. I guess we've not seen the tangible change in policy on a kind of top level or indeed a move towards your kind of like broader political demands around citizens assemblies and so on. Mm. What would you say in response to that as a critique of XR's approach so far? Yeah, there's so many little things to pick up on this. And I mean, it's a really important question. I think, I think first of all, um, I, I wouldn't even, I, the word headwinds popped into my mind, but I hate that word. It's so horrible, but the, we can never underestimate the fact that the the opposition, those people who gain most from the status quo right now, have up their game. You know, the 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 misinformation, the disinformation, the greenwash that has absolutely become amplified. And actually, it, a lot of people can see through this and see that it exists. But that's a sign as well that there's something to push against. Um, our mainstream media has done a very very poor job of communicating the issues, and that's what means protests are necessary. I think um, it depends, you know, we can't say that we've been successful in, in forcing the government to the table in these matters, you know, that, that's manifestly true. Um, and that's part of the reason why we're trying to change the way we're doing it to bring more people into the game, hopefully. Um, but what I think we have been certainly very successful in terms of expanding the conversation and increasing the level of scrutiny and accountability. I mean, can you imagine what would be going on if we if we if we hadn't have been around uh it, it beggars belief really um and the fact that i actually think you know the uh, absolutely huge credit to groups like insulate brit and then just up oil who have, have pushed the boundary in terms of the you know the level of sacrifice that their 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 members have been willing to go for um you know the question is on 
the public's minds like why haven't we insulated our houses better you know that leaves us particularly vulnerable at this time it's absolutely brutal it makes perfect sense that we should have done this 10 years ago 20 years ago we could have started it three years ago um and i think that's you know why are we licensing new oil and gas projects when the united nations secretary general said that's moral and economic matters more and more people are learning that what the government is doing is at odds with all of the best thinking and all of the most sensible thinking. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that you know, destroying your own home is a really stupid thing to do. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're hoping that more and more people will be realizing it. And it's like I sometimes think it's, you know, like the lightning, you know, needs to join in the middle, doesn't it? And whether that happens this April or in the future, I'm hoping it happens like now when people start and, and April is building towards the next big thing. And the next we are building more and more all the time. We've Extinction Rebellion doesn't claim to have like cracked the theory of change that is going to do this. We're just pulling a lever that we feel is is sensible and a good try because we know that you know, Sir David King, the former chief government scientific advisor, said uh, the next two to three years will govern you know the fate of human civilization and we don't have an election uh, until you know whenever we get it we need to make something happen and i think and i am very hopeful because change is a non-linear thing people's minds are changing behind their eyes as i kind of say and at some point well at some point i think this is already we're achieving this point is that people realize that there's something grossly grossly wrong and a lot of people will be thinking well, how, what am I going to do about this? Because I can't just do nothing. And hopefully, pe you know, people will be acting in lots of different ways. There'll be all sorts of things going on, but certainly Extinction Rebellion, I'm hoping, will be offering something that is, you know, really good. And, and for sure, when Extinction Rebellion announced in the new year, there's quite the famous We Quit message that was, you know, obviously a... I think it was kind of a bit clickbaity because it was we quit public disruption, which we have not really done for actually quite a while, you know, directly targeting public disruption as a kind of theory of change. Uh, we said we were going to, you know, mobilize people based on attendance and just coming down and make things easy for people to get involved. I think that, you know, the, the time is right. And the, 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 the idea that you're saying, yeah, ha has our theory been tested fully? I'm still not sure as well. That's probably my final point. You know, COVID really affected us. It affected society really horribly. Um, and it certainly made working, you know, in the grassroots super, super difficult. And we kind of broke momentum. But I think that the pandemic also revealed, did a lot of important work of showing how dysfunctional our current setup is how the people that we most rely upon to keep our you know communities working are so undervalued and and left so often out in the in the cold literally as we speak right now you know in the you know it's the most vulnerable people in this in this uh in this country who are very very important to it and our economy this you know this engine of growth that everyone you know that government tells us is the only thing just can't work if people aren't healthy and if our world isn't healthy if our planet's not healthy if our societies aren't healthy then we're not going to you know it's the economy isn't going to work and so i think there's all sorts of reasons and i guess history will yet to be written but all i can say you know i'm, I'm an athlete and my background was from sports and i just know that you don't you know you don't get better at canoeing by sitting at home um playing tiddlywinks you get get better by going to the gym lifting some weights and going canoeing and this is what we're saying now to people we don't know whether this is going to work but it's going to feel better than just watching this unfold on tv that horrible powerless feeling that a lot of people have we're saying come and join lots of other people who don't want this to be the case either let's get together let's at least feel good that way and let us see if we can build enough pressure on the government to make it do its job because it is in gross dereliction of its duties these days I've got two final questions I wanted to put to you. Um, the first of them is we, you know, we've been talking about the climate crisis and, you know, the scale of what we're up against is huge. And you talked about this at the beginning, you know, you've got the, um, the massive influence of the fossil fuel industry, you've got government inertia, you've got all these different things. In the face of that insurmountable challenge, what gives you hope? I'll tell you simply, for me, 
I think it's a, a rebellious act of defiance to believe in the quality of human beings and to to, to uh, connect the beauty of life itself. You know, um, I see in people again this is from my sporting background but i think this is true you know people are incredible people can do and they can do terrible things but they can do amazing things and people can choose at the at the flip of a switch or the flick of a coin to do something different we have got potential we've got you know our brains are incredibly powerful we've got lots and lots of potential to figure this out we've got lots of reasons to figure this out we're highly incentivized i think it's just a matter of figuring out how we can dismantle the barriers that are stopping common sense from prevailing you know it really is it really isn't rocket science people you know and I think that um to me the thing that gives me faith is that I just believe in I do believe that people are good I do believe that people aren't selfish that they are willing and able to cooperate and to sacrifice for a greater good we are in times now that I believe require some of these attitudes and I think we do we can and I think we will um and we're at the stage now you know 1.3 degrees towards the 1.5 degree kind of you know very danger line and I say that you know there's lots of people out there have already crossed that danger line you know in Pakistan and in in the Horn of Africa but I'm saying you know 1.3 degrees every little thing that we do from now on is going to make it less bad and every little thing that we do now is an opportunity to prove to ourselves that human beings are actually a good a force of goodness on this earth. I reject the idea that we're terrible and an awful bunch. I think we can do something very lovely and we can create a fairer and happier, better world, better society in the process of facing this down. And if not, at least we'll have tried rather than just going, oh, well, we're just rubbish. I'll just sit back and just, you know get ready to get ready to defend my house or something i'm not I just think i think that's completely i'm just gonna i'm not gonna stand for it i'm gonna try my best and in light of that then my final question to you is uh, how can our viewers get involved with the xr actions in april thank you uh, that's a really good question so go on to the extinction rebellion website um there's different you can you can search it out you can find it yourself um i you normally use extinctionrebellion.uk and you can find out about the big one there um, there's groups all around the country and there's information there's tons of information out there but basically put in your diaries 21st or 24th come to london to westminster area on the, any of those days you'll find a great number of very kind lovely good decent citizens who want something very sensible to happen and i think you'll be happy to have tried tried it and yeah the website tells you all sorts of information you can you can sign your name up and what's and you get put on uh, the mailing list to receive like you know information about what's going on and it's as simple as that turn up and yeah you're gonna you're gonna have a good time i'm gonna be there and i want loads of you lot to be there too <laughs> fantastic i have stuck a link uh in the youtube chat so that people can click through and find that and sign up uh, if they wish to uh, but I will let you get on with the rest of your Sunday now uh, but it's been an absolute pleasure thanks so much for joining us thank you very much Chris